We're in Advent. First Sunday of Advent, right here. A time of waiting, a time of promise, a time of wonder and excitement and joy. Shiny lights are all around us. They're beautiful. We're wrapping presents. We're anticipating giving and receiving those presents, and that's all fun. And some of it is idealized and hyped up. Some of it is real and joyful. But, and, and some of us are getting in the Christmas mood. Jesus is coming, and wow, isn't that great and fantastic? But our Advent texts are downers, how things are sad and bad and just wrong and not what we want at all. It's this total juxtaposition of all the facets of life, the good, the bad, and the ugly. See, I have this group of clergy women, and I absolutely adore them, and I could not do ministry without them. They are all amazing. We need each other. We often remind one another as we go through the ups and downs of life and ministry and kids and driving through Kansas City as we do all of that together. We remind each other that we're allowed to feel more than one emotion at a time. That we're not houseplants. We're complicated. And we're wired to feel more than one thing at a time. And that's okay. And sometimes the things that we are feeling can be completely opposite of one another. And isn't that part of what hope is? Feeling more than one thing at once? Can we even have real hope without lament? Without crying out about something that breaks our heart into a million pieces at some point in our life? Do we know what real hope is if everything is always just perfect and beautiful and without pain? I don't think so. That's just optimism. And there's nothing wrong with being optimistic, but it is not the same thing as hope. There's a difference between hope and optimism. Optimism can ignore whatever situation we're in. Optimism can dismiss our feelings and experiences and say everything is going to be fine if optimism is taken too far. We can say everything's fine and we look around and everything's on fire, but no, it's, it's absolutely fine. It's going to be great. Just wait and see. That's optimism hope and hope has gotten dirty hope has gotten bruised not down a few times hope is frayed around the edges stubbornly refuses to yield to whatever it's all around it hope is saying come on god come on come on god i know you've got this i am waiting come on There's this man, William Sloan Coffin, who wrote that hope is a state of mind independent of the state of the world. If your heart's full of hope, you can be persistent when you can't be optimistic. You can keep the faith despite the evidence, knowing that only in doing so has the evidence any chance of changing. So while I'm not optimistic, I am always hopeful. And Nadia Boltz Weber, my favorite theologian that I quote all the time, tells us, when it comes down to it, I want hope. I just want a hope that doesn't disappoint. Don't we want beauty and reconciliation and possibility that comes from something other than our own limitations and the limitations of others? I want a hope that isn't really just naive optimism. I want a hope that finds us living for something that is all at once preposterous and impossible and yet the most real and honest thing we know. That is hope. So here's some things you need to know about that Mark text that we read a little earlier. The people who wrote these, the people for whom they were written in Mark, the time that it was written, they were either in the midst of or written just after Rome had come in and decimated their temple and destroyed their city. They were a people who lived under a brutal occupation. Not, not 
We don't like their political stances. Nah, we don't, we don't like what they've done or what they say or what they're trying to do in our political climate. Not, we think our side is gonna do a much better job because their side is full of incompetent fools. No, brutal, horrific abusive political systems where people were murdered for standing up to the ruling power, crushed into the ground like they were nothing. And Mark, Mark's being written for a people who have had the center and heart of their faith just ripped out like it was nothing. The psalmist, the psalmist is writing about how they are a people who have been conquered and they are suffering because of it. In Corinthians, that nice little passage where Paul says, hey, I'm really glad we're doing this together. They're trying to piece together their faith in their lives after Jesus has been murdered, came back alive, but he left again. And so by now he's been gone. For quite a while and he promised to come back and they're trying hard to hang on but they're not so sure anymore what that looks like and they're not so sure anymore what their future looks like as they're waiting for Jesus and so they're waiting for his return they're waiting for things to get better but they don't really know what they're doing does that sound familiar to anybody I mean I think I go through life 99.9 percent .9 not sure what I'm doing so in all of these situations, the psalmist, the Markan text, the Corinthians text, all of these situations, even though it looks like things are going bad and it looks like things are going south, these people find hope, impossible, miraculous, beautiful hope, hope that doesn't disappoint, a hope that is all at once preposterous and impossible, and yet the most real thing that these people have ever known in their life. It's an interesting thing, hope. It seems like when it is the hardest to maintain, when it's a moment when we are the most desperate for it, when we are at our weakest, hope finds us and pulls us up out of that despair and we cling to it like the life preserver it is. Now, maybe these texts are a little heavy for a Sunday morning in which we are all starting to get into that magical Christmas spirit that we like to tell ourselves exists, full of good cheer and pretty lights and a time when we're supposed to be excited and anticipating all the good times and things coming our way, and it is. But also, we don't get to skip out on real life. Because things are hard all around. If it's, if it's not hard in our own life, if we're not grieving, if we're not depressed, if we're not lonely, if we're not having financial problems, if we're not worried about our parents or our kids or our jobs or something, if things are absolutely great, somewhere around us, it's not so great for somebody. Somebody that we love has issues with their jobs and their families and their health and their grieving. Things in our world are scary sometimes. People all over the world are living the lament of the psalmist right now. But hope, hope is truly a powerful bomb to all the hard things that press up against us. Hope is not passive. Hope is an active force in your life and in the lives of the people around you right now, and you can nurture it and encourage it along its path. So I was watching this TikTok the other day, as one does, probably when I was supposed to be writing this sermon, but anyway. I don't even know why I was watching it, but it was this guy out in the middle of the woods talking about how you survive if you get stranded and you don't have any supplies. Like, 
Like, do I look like the kind of gal that's going to get stranded in the woods or that I want to I wanna go live off grid? I mean, come on, but I was fascinated by this TikTok, this guy with his long beard and his, now he was wearing flannels, so he had that going for him. But just in case I ever found myself in that situation, I was watching this guy and he made a fire out of nothing. He walked around, none of it was set up, of course. He walked around and he pulled out some fluff of some dried flower pod thing and he he skimmed off some shavings of some dead tree branch and he he put it together and he found a piece of glass he found of course that wasn't planted but he found a piece of glass he found and 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 had the sun come you know like when we were kids you know what we were doing to ants which is not what we're preaching about this morning but but he did that to that little piece of fluff and those little bitty skinny little shavings Things, and, and pretty soon there was this little, this little puff of smoke. I'm sure he didn't use matches and, and edit that out. This little piece of smoke. And then he fed it and nurtured it and came along and it had this little itty bitty flame. Like you almost had to guess that there was a flame there, but little by little he fed that little flame. And before long, he had this great roaring campfire seems ridiculous seems impossible maybe maybe even a little unbelievable and yet that flame persisted it was there and it did its job of keeping him warm hope is always biding its time hope is always there buried in the background, in your back pocket, in somebody else's back pocket, hope is always there, biding its time, waiting for the moment when you need it most. And then in that moment, God nurtures it and grows it until it's just what you need to keep your faith warm. Amen. Let's pray. God, we give thanks to you this morning for hope. However it exists in our lives, if it is there and feels rich and nourished and, and abundant, or if it's just this tiny smokeless flame just, just starting out, we know that it's there and we are grateful for it. God, we are grateful for you and your spirit which moves among us this morning, whether we are in this space or at home worshiping, whatever we do, wherever we go, you know your spirit covers us with your love. And so we come to you this morning, we lift up all of those who feel hopeless and ask that you cover them with all the hope that they need. Help us to know your love. Help us to share your love with those who, who are in need of it, God. Bless us in our lives and our hearts as we go about being faithful to you in all the ways that we need. Amen.